All right, now, now that your hands are warmed up, let me ask a, a question. How many of you, by a show of hands, and you can raise them like an alligator or like something bigger, how many of you would say you struggle with patience? Oh, wow, okay, this is a large group. All right, you can put your hands down, okay. Now the other hand, we'll warm the other hand up now. How many of you would say you struggle with anger? Okay, you can put them down. That one is always smaller. There's almost twice, in this case, almost three times as many people raise their hands for patient struggle, but not anger struggle. And here's what's fascinating about that logic. The whole reason people are impatient is because they are angry. That's the only reason impatience exists. So if you struggle with one, by default, you must struggle with the other. But one is okay to admit, and the other one is gross to admit, right? That's why we don't do it. No one thinks they struggle with anger, but I promise you, if you have a patience issue, you have an anger issue. Admitting it or not is irrelevant. That's the logic. The reason I'm bringing that up is because we look at the paragraph that John has for us in 1 John today. He's going to bring this up. He's been very theoretical and ethereal in his uh, content. Today it's going to get very practical. Um, So let's look at where he's at. It's in chapter 3 of 1 John, starting in verse 11. I'll read it to you. We'll have it on the screen as well. John says, This is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers whoever does not love abides in death everyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him so as you look at those two or few verses there you see there's a lot to talk about murder and hate and all that is is anger and we know that's anger because jesus equated all that stuff in matthew 5 with anger So that's the topic we have today, and it's important that we talk about it because all doctors have shown that anger does more damage to the body than physical and intellectual strain or emotional stress. Anger does more damage to the body. So it's important that we talk about it. John brought it up. We need to talk about anger, which is the nuclear energy of the human heart. And I chose that phrase for a reason. Nuclear energy is powerful, right? But if it's, if it's harnessed well and aimed well, it can do so much good. Now, it's weird to hear that anger can be used for good, and it can be. But if it's handled poorly, if it's unstable, like nuclear energy there can be a gigantic implosion or explosion. So there are three things today I would like to make clear as we talk about this topic of anger. The first one is really important, if you ask me, especially talking amongst the church, and that is anger is not a sin. And I don't know that everyone knows that. Judging by how few people raise their hands on the second one, I don't, I, I'm pretty sure they don't. The truth is, anger is not a sin. When Paul talked to the Ephesians, he told them, in your anger, do not sin. He didn't say it was a problem to have it. He just says how it gets expressed is the problem. So, in your anger, do not sin. We know from looking at the Gospels, Jesus got angry multiple times. Not once, not just the table turning over thing. He got angry multiple times. If you don't believe me, read the Gospels. You'll see it pretty quickly. But there's something else that stands out from the book of Exodus that most people forget. When God told Moses, Moses said, God, I want to see your glory, the thing that makes you you. And God said, you can't handle it, but if you hide here, I'll pass by you. You can handle maybe the shadow of my glory. That's as close as you're going to get. So that's what happened. God passed by, and as God's glory, now get this, As God's glory was passing by Moses, do you know what the first thing God said to him? Exodus 34, verse 6 says, God proclaimed, I am slow to anger. The first thing God wanted 
Moses to know about what made him unique and special and awesome isn't that he's immune to anger, but that he's slow to anger. Anger is not a sin. It never has been and never will be. It's the evidence, actually, of love. Anger is the evidence of love. It's not the opposite of love. It's the evidence of love because of what it means to have anger. So let's define it and throw it up on the screen for you. Five words, easy to remember. Anger is defending something valuable being threatened. Something you care about deeply is being threatened, and that's where anger pops up. Now, you may say to yourself, or someone may say next to you, you don't know who I'm married to. You don't know who I live with. They never get angry. I have thrown things at their head just to try to make them angry, and they never get angry. If you find somebody, if you know somebody who seems to be just impossible to make angry, what you have demonstrated is you found somebody who has a real strong deficiency for love. If you have an abundance of anger, all that says is, man, you are caring about something or some things a whole lot. Otherwise, you wouldn't be triggered so much. Because anger is defending what is valuable that's being threatened. If you don't think anything's ever being threatened, then you're probably more like a Buddhist than a Christian because the whole Buddhism tradition teaches people, detach yourself from caring about anything and then you're never going to be mad and you're never going to suffer. The reason those things happen is because you care so much. The answer, quit caring. When Tiger Woods came out after decimating, not this car accident, but after decimating his career with his moral behavior, he said he was trying to get back to his mother's teaching of his Buddhism roots And that's what it was teaching. The reason I got all out of whack in my life is because I was caring about some things too much. And now I just don't want to care about anything. That's the Buddhism teaching. And people who just never are angry inside or outside, it's probably because they don't love a whole lot. Anger is the flip side of love. God's wrath is mentioned constantly from Genesis to Revelation. And it's not because he's temperamental. It's because he's so loving. You can't have love without anger. Anger is not a sin. It's defending something valuable. I'll give you a story as an example. When we lived in Little Rock, I used to go exercise at this recreation facility. And the the weight room area, I know it's comical to look at me and think that I've ever lifted a weight, but I used to. So anyway... This weight facility was on the second floor and it overlooked the gym. In fact, that picture up there is, is, is my view from that weight facility. And so I, I loved it because I not only got to focus on what I was doing, I got to see what was going on down below. Well, the days and the times that I had free to go work out, there was a young, one young man who came into the gym all the time. He was a young man with Down syndrome, about 25 years old. His name was Doug. And Doug loved basketball. And I know that because he always brought his own basketball and it had his name written on it about 50 times. So no one would ever take his ball. I love this kid. And there'd be occasional times I would rebound for him when he'd shoot free throws and such. And we had some of the best talks. I I love this kid. After working out here for about six months, Doug became one of my favorites. One day I was up there working out, saw Doug come in. I'm smiling. I'm like, I'm going to get done with this, go hang out with Doug a little bit. Shortly after I saw him, a high school kid walked into the gym. A high school kid I had never seen before was looking a little rough. The minute that high school kid entered the gym, he started picking on Doug verbally. I quit working out. I came to that railing and started watching. Then I saw that kid take his basketball and hit Doug's out of the air and make it go into the corner and far away. And Doug handled it so well, just said, hey man, don't do that. Knock it off. Or just wouldn't say anything. The third time that bully hit Doug's ball away, I decided something has to be done. So I left my perch from up there and went down to confront the bully. Because something valuable needed defending. So, before we go any further, first thing I need everyone to know from God's Word, from several examples, anger is not a sin. It's evidence of love. Now... (laughs) I have to make that clear because what I'm about to say may sound like a contradiction. Anger is not a sin. That is true. But (laughs) anger is often sinful. That's the next thing I need you to know. Anger is often sinful. It's not a sin in theory 
It becomes sinful oftentimes in practice. And let me give you two examples of how that happens. Anger is sinful when it defends the wrong thing. The wrong valuable thing. Then it's a problem. And the verse I want to show you is in is verse 12 that we looked at. John wrote, "Why did Cain murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. What was Cain defending? What made him so angry to the point of murder? Remember, anger doesn't occur unless something valuable needs defending. What valuable thing was being threatened according to Cain? This one's simple. It's his reputation. Cain's reputation was being threatened because everyone, like his parents, were looking at his brother and look how good your brother is. Way to go, Abel. You're so good at this. You're such a joy to be around. They weren't saying you're our favorite son, but you get the idea. How does that make the other brother feel? Less. And when how you feel about yourself and how other people perceive you is being threatened, it is not unlikely for anger to spring up and defend that thing, even in extreme ways. There is a very powerful verse in Jeremiah 45, of all places, that has stuck with me for years. Can't get it out of my head, never will. So I thought I would share it with you. It helps me a lot as I'm thinking through things like anger. Here's the verse. Jeremiah says, do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. Why is it so easy to get angry over rumors and rejection? Do any, does anyone besides me get angry over that stuff? When people reject you or spread rumors about you that aren't true, especially when they're negative? No one's upset about positive rumors, right? If someone made up a rumor like, he did something really awesome, you should know this, and that wasn't true, I wouldn't correct them, and then it wouldn't bug me either. Go right ahead. Spread all the positive rumors you want, but that's not the stuff that makes me mad or anyone else mad that I know. It's the negative ones, right? Why does that stuff make us so mad? But the thousands of people being mistreated and abused across the planet don't. How about the billions today? The billions of people today who will not spend eternity with Christ unless a change happens. That doesn't usually make people upset or angry. It's not that. It's the rejections and the rumors that hit us. Can anybody else relate to that? Is, that? is it just me? Now, maybe you're holy and perfect, and you get upset about eternal lostness more than the rumors against you. Maybe you do. I don't. I struggle with the other one. There's a disproportion order to my anger. I think here's part of the reason. The rumors and rejections against me or people I love, that's real. Meaning, that's tangible. I can feel those. The love of God that relates to eternal life, the love of God is abstract. Isn't it? It's not near as tangible. I'm not saying one's more real than the other. I'm saying one feels more real than the other. Doesn't it? Incidentally, as a church, this is why we do things like baptism. It's why we do things like singing and taking communion. It's not just because God said these are good things to do and you should do them. The reason he said that is because those things make the abstract love of God feel more real. It's why for some of you who are in church today for the first time, maybe in a long time, man, it feels different, doesn't it, when you're together doing these things than when you're at your house pouring your own grape juice, tearing off your own Wonder Bread and having communion? Not that those aren't wonderful things. It just doesn't feel as, it doesn't connect you to the love of God as well as when you're around a community doing it. Doesn't it feel a bit different when you're singing songs together versus alone? The reason why is it takes what's real but abstract, the love of God, and makes it real. It's also why we get so angry about the rejections. And all that other things. I hear an amen from back there. That's not what you're translating. That's what I'm translating. I love it. Thank you for that amen, sister, brother. I can't tell from here. (laughs) 
So here's a question I wanted to ask myself. What things make me the most angry the most quickly? Do I even know that? As I've observed other people in places, here's what I observe the most. Reputation, I would say, is number one. This is what, not just me, most people I know, the things that make most people the most mad the most quickly is their reputation. How they are being perceived, how they are looking to other people. Most people have pretty short fuses on that. So my parents lose it with their kids in public places because if their kid is doing something wrong or lazy or not doing something, that shows on mom and dad, and I can't have that. But I also wrote down a close second and third are probably my plans and my schedule. For instance, another participation time. So no one struggles in here with anger, but just a few of us. The few of us who do struggle with anger, how many of you get anger when you're driving? Feel anger when you're driving? Okay, there's more now than there was before. Okay. Anger at other drivers. Let me make it specific. You're angry at other drivers. Anyone relate to that, feel that? Why are you angry at other drivers? Let's boil it down. What's, what's, what valuable thing is being threatened to trigger that anger? Sometimes it's maybe safety. These other drivers are jeopardizing the safety of someone else. Sometimes it's that. Usually, it's these other dinglings are messing up my schedule. I have a plan and a place, and they're wrecking it. And we get angry, maybe furious. Now, I'll be honest, I struggle with anger, but not when I'm driving, mostly because I'm the one causing other people problems. <laughs> So I have a lot of grace for this because I know I'm not the best driver in the world. So anger is not a sin, but it gets sinful when we defend the wrong thing. The great thing for ourselves. When we defend that, that's when it gets sinful. The second way it gets sinful is when we release it to destroy the person and not the problem. There are two ways anger gets released. We blow up or we clam up. Blowing up destroys other people. Clamming up, which is what most religious people think is the best answer to anger, don't blow up and damage someone else. Just hold it in. Bite your tongue. Keep your mouth shut. Keep quiet. Hold it in. All that does is eat you away. Destroys you. That's not any better. It feels like a better solution than the blowing up, right? But blowing up and clamming up are both sinful ways to release anger because both of those things destroy people, not the problem. They don't address the problem. And it happens so often with anger. Want me to finish my story from the rec center? So I went down to confront this bully. Here's what I didn't do. I didn't walk in and say, hey, young man, let's have a talk. I didn't do that. Here's what I did. And I plotted it the whole way down the stairs to the gym. I said, hey, I'm kind of new here, total lie, kind of new here, and I'm finishing my workout, not true either, and I just want to get some cardio in before I head home. You want to play one-on-one a little bit so I can just kind of get a workout in? I said, I'm not very good. (laughs) And he goes, sure, whatever. So I said, can I take a few shots first just to warm up? So I took three shots as badly as I've ever taken shots. So he will not see what's about to happen. So we start with the game, and I have no intent of winning the game. Beating this kid would have been easy because he had no training. I didn't want to win the game. I wanted to punish him physically, and that's what I did. I spent the next five minutes putting him on his back, making him bleed from two different places, where he got so irate, he stood up, threw the ball at my head as hard as he could. I caught it, set it down, and he began to walk out of the gym cussing at me. So I ran after him. Couldn't catch him because he was mad. And I said, if you ever treat this young man like you just did again, what you just got will be 10 times worse and probably illegal. (laughs) Oh, by the way, want to come to my youth group this week? (laughs) Obviously, I didn't say that. I just ruined my total witness. Was it right to get upset 
at bullying? Yes. So here's the question. It's not the sin to be angry at that. It's sinful to destroy people and not the problem. So the challenge is, can I battle bullying without destroying the bully? Saying nothing and doing nothing isn't an option either. Now I'm just holding it in and it's eating me up. i got to do something. Can I battle it in a way that doesn't destroy the bully? I think so. So here's the best method I've got for handling anger well. Three steps. Number one, in handling our anger, admit it. This is, I would argue from our show of hand experiment earlier, this is one of the hardest things to say. It takes a lot of vulnerability to say and admit out loud, I'm angry. Because in our culture, that feels like weakness. No one has a problem saying, I struggle with patience. That doesn't feel like weakness. Because it seems like everybody struggles with that. But few people want to admit they're angry. And the reality is, if everyone struggles with this one, then they are struggling with this one. So admit it. I'm angry. And as we're in the process of admitting this, we've got to recognize a pattern. If you've been wronged by someone or something, I don't know, sometime before, you are going to more quickly be triggered and get angry by that person or that thing or representation of them. I have a friend who was married and he got betrayed by his wife, and to this day he is angry at women. He acts differently around women, thinks differently around women. He just lumps all of them into that category. Now, it's not fair, and he's never really dealt with this. And there are some people who've been wronged by a church. And now, they are suspicious and skeptical of every religious institution again. So as we're admitting it, we need to recognize that pattern. But it's something else. We also need to recognize anger loves to hide itself which is why I thought nobody really raised their hand. It's not because you're, you know, you're not honest. You're maybe missing it. The Bible calls anger a root of bitterness. Paul calls it that. Have you heard of that? The Bible doesn't refer to anger as a branch of bitterness, but a root. Branches are easy to see. Roots are nearly impossible to see. Not only do they go down deep, they're invisible. So admitting anger is not easy. Second step in handling our anger well is not just admitting it, it's inspecting it. So here is the courageous question that is hard to ask but essential. What is the thing I am defending? What is the thing, the valuable thing that is angering me that is worth defending? What is that thing? What is that valuable thing? Why am I angry at my kids, my spouse, my car, my coach, my pastor? How about that? Why am I angry at that person? What is the thing that I have to defend? And this anger is being triggered to defend something being threatened. What is being threatened? What is that thing? What is that thing? What is that thing? thing? The answer is often embarrassing from someone who's been trying to do this on a regular basis. The answer is often my ego. That's what I'm defending. How I look. How I'm perceived. Who likes me? Who doesn't? So maybe in Jeremiah's words, a better way to word this would be, what great things am I seeking for myself? That my ego has to have. Because for most of us, the valuable things that we want to defend are things we have to have. What are those things? Do you know? So one, you've got to admit you're angry. Two, you've got to inspect it to find out where in the world it's coming from. And then three, after admitting it and inspecting it, then the right thing to do is to channel it. Channel the anger. Don't blow up. Paul said, get rid of all uh, anger, rage, Uh, bitterness, slander, malice. All those things are examples of blowing up. So blowing up's not the right thing to do. But in the same breath, Paul also said, don't let the sun go down on your anger. That's clamming up. You don't want to blow up. Has anyone ever vented before? Does anyone like venting? 
I don't mean on a fence post. I mean on a, with another human being. Stop it. That's blowing up. That's not making it better. Getting around someone else who will, you're right, amen, preach it, sister, whatever, that is not helpful for your anger. You're just going to increase it. You're going to build your ego and defend the wrong thing even stronger. So venting is bad. We need to channel it, not by blowing up, that's venting, not by clamming up, that destroys us. We have to do a surgical strike on the problem, not the person. So how does that look? Here's how it looks. Thinking things like what I'm about to say or saying these things. Saying, this is not okay. This, is, this feels bad. This hurts. What can we do? What changes can we make to fix or address this? Do you notice what I left out in all those statements? You. Me. It took people right out of it. Talk about the problem. The problem isn't him or her or you. The problem is it. It's a thing outside of you. What can we do to change this? This is not okay. You start with things like, you always, you never, you have a problem. Have you, many of you found successful resolution in conflict by talking like that? Everybody say no. No, because the other person never responds. You know what? You're right. I do always do that. <laughs> no one does that. The minute, bring you, the minute you said the word you with the tone you had, you could have said, you are always loving. You are the kindest person I know. Well, they're not going to hear the rest of it. You with that tone puts the guard up and ready to defend yourself and hit in an argument. See, I just started one by yelling. I am sorry. <laughs> Surgical strike on the problem. Not the person, but the problem. Let's conclude. I want to read one verse to you that I read earlier. It's in verse 14. This is supposed to be the hope that enables us to handle this anger well. John says, We know that we have passed out of death into life. We have passed out of death into life. Past means Jesus Christ on the cross made that possible. John can't say we've passed anywhere unless Jesus goes to the cross. And let me remind me and everybody else, when Jesus was getting ready for the cross, going through the cross, he is enduring mistreatment and anger and abuse, and he's not blowing up, and he's not clamming up. Instead, he says one of the hardest sentences I think a human being has ever said. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's attacking the problem. That's a surgical strike on the problem, not the people, not the person. And not just when Jesus did that. History books are full of what happened when early Christians were thrown into arenas to be executed violently, and instead of you know, going into a fetal position in the corner or just banding together, lashing curses out at their oppressors. What they did is the same thing Christ did. They said in unison, with peace on their face, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And thousands of people watching went, hmm, that's different. How can they say that? Nobody talks like that. Hallelujah. If we can do that, it's the most powerful and humble thing we can do, but it is not easy. It's because someone has passed. And so for us to have the power to be able to say with genuine uh, emotions and, and spirit, Father, forgive them. They, they don't know what they're doing. For us to be able to say that, that means, that means Christ has to have more weight more glory than my gifts, my rights, my issues. Christ has to have more weight than that. That's the only way it works. But if He does, if we can give what He did on the cross the weight it deserves, we have a chance to handle anger like He did.